Good morning, everyone. It's an absolutely beautiful day, and that humidity has gone down, at least for a while. I don't know how many of you are as happy about that as I am. Um, but it's really good to have you all here this morning. And thank you, Mimi, for all those songs. You played some of my favorite worship songs. You had Michael W. Smith and Twyla Paris in there. And, and just and um, How Great Thou Art is one of my father's favorite hymns. And so that was just beautiful. She, she asked me this week, what should I play? I'm like, oh, pick whatever you feel like the Lord wants you to play. So I love how the Lord does that. Uh, before we go into our call to worship this morning, just a couple things to remind you of. If you have prayer requests that you want to submit for uh, the Congo Care, please do that by text or email directly to Betty, especially this week. Rachel is on vacation, so she is not in the office. Uh, we won't be taking those here. We don't have the forms in there. And I uh, won't be praying specifically for prayer requests by name um, here, just because we are posting the service online and we want to receive respect uh, people's privacy for that but please know that we're still sending Congo care out and we'll still at least monthly be sending out by email the little prayer booklet with with all the updates and things I want this morning to give a really huge shout out to some people now the people I'm going to mention none of them would want me to do that but here is what happened last week uh, Patrick is the director of the food pantry, and so he was putting in an order from Feeding America. And the way that that usually works is you have to put it in the Thursday before the first Monday of the month, and they deliver on the first Monday of the month. Well, he put the order in, and when he was looking at it, he had me look at all the directions, and it said because of the 4th of July holiday, it would be delivered on Tuesday, July 7th. Great, he got people to work for him. Monday, July 6th, he got a phone call saying, we're here in Ionia, where are you? And so Patrick called Don Rice and Ron Nelson, who immediately went with him to Ionia to pick up 3,000 pounds of food, bring it back here, and Dave Bosenberg met them here, and they had to unload it and put it in our pantry. And if you remember, it was a warmish day that day. It was hot, downright hot. And Patrick said, you guys hustled. You were hustling. In fact, I was willing to help, but I felt like I was going to be in your way and get mowed down. You guys did a great job. And then later in the afternoon, Phil Huber, who works in our pa pantry regularly and puts things on the shelves, um, came to open all the packages and put them on the shelves. And Susie Smith and Dean Ball came, and Dean cheered from the sidelines while Susie and Phil put all that stuff on the shelves in the afternoon. So I just really want to thank all of you. You saved my husband's sandwich for one thing personally but what a great service to the Lord and to this community so thank you very much for stepping up for that a huge shout out to all of you and our pantry looks amazing right now well our call to worship do we have our call to worship on the screen it's a rather lengthy one I'll just advance that it's from Psalm 65 but as I read it I thought so many of you are gardeners or have been gardeners and it talks so much about nature and God's care and direction in nature that I thought we should do all of it to a call to worship so um, it will go on for several screens just to to give you a heads up so let's do our call to worship what mighty praise, O God, belongs to you in Zion. We will fulfill our vows to you. For you answer our prayers. All of us must come to you. Though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. What joy for those you choose to bring near, those who live in your holy courts. What festivities await us inside your holy temple. You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God, our Savior. You are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. You formed the mountains by your power and armed yourself with mighty strength. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves and silenced the shouting of the nations. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. 
From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. You take care of the earth and water it, making it rich and fertile. The river of God has plenty of water. It provides a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have ordered it so. You drench the plowed ground with rain, melting the clods and leveling the ridges. You soften the earth with showers and bless its abundant crops. You crown the year with a bountiful harvest. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness become a lush pasture and the hillsides blossom with joy. The meadows are clothed with flocks of sheep and the valleys are carpeted with grain. They all shout and sing for joy. Uh, we're going to do our gospel scripture reading this morning, which, if you were here last week, it is going to be a dumb reading. That's my new favorite little phrase. A dumb reading was something that I learned in the worship service for the annual conference, that it's a reading of scripture that is not the reading that is going to be taught on. It's a standalone scripture reading. And this is a, I think, familiar passage from the book of Matthew, Matthew 13 verses 1 through 9 and then 18 through 23 it's a parable story that jesus told and then the interpretation that he gives to his disciples so matthew 13 beginning at verse 1 later that same day jesus left the house and sat beside the lake a large crowd soon gathered around him so he got into a boat there when he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore he told many stories in the forms of parables such as this one Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still others fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And then skipping down to verse 18. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. We're going to go now to a time of prayer, and there will be times during this uh, prayer time when I'll just leave a moment of silence for you to offer from your heart, or even if you want to say them verbally, your um, prayers of adoration and thanks to the Lord. So let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for the blessing of being able to be here together in your presence lifting your name high father we praise you and adore you that you are our gracious almighty compassionate and loving god father through this week there may have been times that we didn't recognize or, or didn't consciously uh, pay attention to your presence with us but maybe later maybe now in this moment we are remembering how great you are to us you care for us. You sustain us. 
and you are there to give us mercy and grace in our times of need. And we praise you, Father, that that is who you are, that you are not a harsh or a distant God, but that you are close and near to us. And so, Father, we come to you this morning looking at our own hearts and our own paths that we have taken this week. We've been talking over these past couple weeks and last week about how we have a sin nature that pulls at us to pull us away from serving you. And maybe this week we followed that path instead of choosing to claim the freedom you've given us. And so we take this moment of silence, Father, to examine our hearts, to let you examine our hearts and bring up before you those things which we need to confess to you in this moment. Thank you, Father, that as we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we thank you for your presence and your working in our lives this week, the way you have touched us in our physical needs, in our emotional needs, in our spiritual needs the way you are working in the lives of those around us. Even if the prognosis doesn't seem good, you are still there sustaining and giving hope, Father. And we lean upon you, thanking you that you are compassionate and you know how you have made us, that we are frail and we need your sustaining grace. Thank you, Father for allowing us the energy and the health and the ability to be here in your presence or to be able to listen to this message on the internet or on our phones or wherever we might be. Father, we thank you that your word, which was written so long ago, remains vibrant and alive because it is empowered by your Holy Spirit as we are. We thank you that you are the one who makes it possible for us to live in victory and to live abundantly. We come to you now, Father, with those requests and needs that are upon our hearts, things that are intensely personal for us. And in these moments of silence, we lift those up to you now. Father, we intercede on behalf of our community, our state, our country. Uh, Father, I read this morning of a shooting in Lansing that left at least five people dead, and there are families grieving this morning. There are others who are unable to be with loved ones in the hospital or in nursing homes, or because of distance, they're not able to travel at this time to see them. We ask, Father, that you will unite them in heart in spirit, that you will comfort the grieving. And Father, we ask that you will move us to be your ambassadors, your salt and light in this world, as you give us opportunity and sensitivity to those around us. And we do that as we come to you praying the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And lead us not, in, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 
So today we're concluding our little three-week series in Romans 6, 7, and 8. And so our passage that I'm going to speak about today is from the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 8. Um, I hope maybe some of you had an opportunity to read that in preparation for today. Uh, these are the words of Paul. Again, Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life. Because you have been made right with God, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Let's pray as we go to the message time. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word, and it speaks of, of your Holy Spirit, and we know that it's by your Holy Spirit that we can understand what you speak to us. So in these moments, remove from our minds those distractions, those things that would uh, pull us away from hearing your voice, from allowing your Holy Spirit to teach us, to transform us, to give us victory. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Last week, I started with a story from Chuck Swindoll about him visiting the um, art gallery where pieces by portrait painter Dimitri Vale were displayed. And it talked about how he had seen all these wonderful portraits, came to the end, and saw this portrait of a person that just seemed really somber and it ended up that it was a self-portrait of Dimitri Vale and the attendant in the gallery said that he had painted it uh, during a time of intense struggle and last week we looked at chapter 7 of Romans which talked about that struggle we talked about how uh, when we come to know Christ we have the Holy Spirit but our sin nature still remains with us uh, as long as we live physically and and there's this this pulling going on and Paul gives this this really wretched picture of struggling against sin and uh, we understood as we talked that we are not able on our own to win that struggle, that it's the power of Jesus Christ that does that. And uh, the story of Dimitri Vail, the attendant said, you know, we're all hopeful that the artist can paint a, a better self-portrait in a better time when he's in a better frame of mind. And Swindoll says that, you know, we all have to surrender to the fact that we're not able to live the Christian life simply by willpower. Joni Yoder writes a story in the uh, Our Daily Bread about being on a plane, and the man she sat next to said, you know, I just feel like when I'm on this plane, it's all my willpower is keeping this plane in the air. Well, we know it's not. There's no 
willpower that we have that could do that. And in the same way, we do not have enough willpower on our own to be able to overcome the nature of sin and live in the freedom and victory that Christ gives us because it's Christ that gives it to us. And the, the chapter 7 seems to be this, this passage that is like, oh, our life is so miserable. But Paul doesn't stop painting there. He doesn't stop painting the portrait of the follower of Christ there. He goes on to chapter 8. And it's a new portrait. A new portrait that reflects our standing in Christ. A standing of grace and of victory. And so as we come to chapter 8, the first verse uh, starts with, Therefore... And I remember having a pastor uh, that said, when you come to the word, therefore, you need to look at what came before it so that you know what it's there for. Amen. And what comes right before that is not this wretched, helpless picture, but the wretched, helpless picture saying, who's going to help me? And Romans 7, verse 25 says, thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, all these things that we're going to look at this morning are true. Jesus answers the struggle for us. Our standing in Christ involves much more than gaining eternal life in heaven with Christ when we die. It involves victory in the here and now. Romans 7 was, in a sense, this before portrait. You know how they show those before and after pictures for weight loss programs, you know, or exercise programs? It's this before portrait. But now, because of the finished work of Christ, we are the after portrait in a better time, in a better frame of mind. And all that comes in Romans 8 is there because of Jesus. We have a new standing, a new standing before God. Richard DeHaan wrote in Our Daily Bread, In 1776, the 13 British colonies in North America protested the limitations placed on them by the King of England and engaged in a struggle that gave birth to a brand new republic. We just celebrated that. The infant nation soon adopted that now famous document known as the Declaration of what? Independence. Dahan writes that almost 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus cried out on the cross, It is finished, proclaiming the believer's declaration of independence. All of humanity was under the tyranny of sin and death, but Christ, the sinless one, took our place on Calvary and died for our sins. Having satisfied God's righteous demands, he now sets free for eternity all who trust in him. We are thankful to God, Dahan writes, for any freedom we enjoy in a nation. But above all, believers everywhere can praise him for the freedom that is found in Christ. And so in the first verses of this passage, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of our sinful nature. So God did what the law couldn't do. He sent his own son in a body like we have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. The language of this chapter doesn't say, we hope that this will happen and maybe it's true. It says, this has happened. This is true. Done. We are free from judgment. We are free from defeat. We have a new standing in, before God. And scripture teaches us that Christ's death and resurrection and ascension places him before God the Father for us. It's as if Christ is standing between us and God, and God is seeing us through the finished work of Christ. And so Chuck Swindoll says we are eternally secure, internally free, and positionally righteous before God. And as I wrote those things, I thought of the, you know, modern way of being dramatic, you know, with the mic, and you, you say a, a very profound thing, and they say, done, and they drop the mic. That's what's happening here. It's done. You are free. You've been freed from the power of sin. You are now victorious. Mic drop. It's a new portrait. But then Paul goes on because maybe the reader is saying, eh, I'm not so sure. 
And so he goes on to give a contrast in the next several verses. And so you're, you're probably not all going to be able to see what I write up here, but I thought it would be a good I, visual to do a little chart. Um, Paul tends to go back and forth, and sometimes it's hard to keep track of what he's saying. But we're going to look at the contrast of the portraits that Paul gives. And he's basically giving you a contrast uh, of lives under the control of sin or under the control of the Holy Spirit. And so in verse 5, he says, Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit Think about things that please God. And so, well, that's not going to work too well. There we go. So we have what often is termed the flesh, or our sinful nature, and a life controlled by the Spirit. And in the flesh, we have sinful thoughts. That's what you think about. No one else may know it, but you know it. But here, by the spirits, our thoughts please God. It's kind of that Philippians 4, 7, and 8, whatever is pleasing and good and pure, those things are pleasing to God. And then in verse 6, he says, So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. And I circled on my manuscript the word letting, meaning that we have that choice. We have that choice what we allow. And so here it brings death. And he's not just talking about physical death. He, death in Scripture is also separation from relationship with God. So there's death. Here there is life and peace. In verse 7, he says, The sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. And so there's war with God here. But again, here, there's peace with God. And so verse 8 says, That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Here you can please God. But here, the person that you're pleasing is yourself. Because you're doing what you want to do or whatever's pulling you to be done. And so there's a core contrast over all of this is that here you have not the Spirit. Paul uses those words. But here you have the Spirit. It's not about your efforts and your actions. It's about who is controlling you. And F.B. Meyer puts it very well, I think. He said, if it were possible which it is not. If it were possible for you to produce the same virtues in yourself, self-will, willpower, which are produced by the Holy Spirit, yet even those wouldn't suffice, suffice because the text is absolute. It doesn't say if any man have not the works of the Spirit or influences of the Spirit or the general character which comes from the Spirit. It goes deeper and declares if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of God's. The difference between the regenerate and the unregenerate is not one of degree, but of kind. Having not the Spirit or having the Spirit. That's why Pentecost is so important. It's not about looking the part, but being transformed inside by the presence of the Spirit. And so verses 5 through 8 talk about having not the Spirit, but when you move to verses 9 through 11, uh, he begins to tell you what the Spirit of God in you is like. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. 
He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit within you. And so there's having not the Spirit or having the Spirit. And Swindoll says, Chuck Swindoll says, by the presence of the Holy Spirit, we have gained the capacity to think and to choose how we're going to live. Are you going to live as the portrait that, Je that, that Jesus says you are? Or are you going to live as sin tries to deceive you into believing you are? It's almost as if we've been given new DNA to become a new creation. Scripture says that somewhere. The old is gone in, first, in Corinthians. Uh, you are a new creation. And we, d we didn't read as far in chapter 8 um, as I'm going to read now, but Paul goes on not just to say it's a contrast between having not the Spirit and having the Spirit, but of going to the point where the Spirit has you. There's a difference between having the Spirit, where you can kind of pull back and say, okay, that's enough Spirit, I don't want you in this part of my life. There's a difference to saying, you have all of me, Holy Spirit. And so in verses 12 through 14, Paul continues and says another, Therefore, because of all this, because you have the Spirit and you are to be controlled by the Spirit now, therefore, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. So when that sinful thought and that desire to do what you know is displeasing to God comes and you say, I can't help it, God says, yeah, you can. The Holy Spirit allows you to do that. He says, you are under no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You're a new person. And it happens. It can happen the moment you've received Christ or the moment that you make that decision saying, God, I want that. I want that victory. I'm tired of being a portrait of a struggling person. I don't want to be the wretched picture. I want to be the no condemnation, no judgment, freed picture. And John Stott writes, there's no need for us to wait as the 120 had to wait for the Spirit to come on the day of Pentecost. Christ's sacrifice enables our minds to be controlled and our hearts filled with the Holy Spirit, the pr promised divine counselor. And this means that we should have our minds and our wills set on God's desires, not on our own sinful urgings. The contrast could not be more complete. A life filled with the Spirit is full of life, not death. It is characterized by peace, not hostility toward God. It submits obediently to God's law, which is not even possible without the Holy Spirit. It's a new portrait. That's who you are in Christ. You're not chapter 7. You're chapter 8. If you know Christ as your Savior, His Holy Spirit lives in you. You are chapter 8 portrait. But maybe that doesn't feel true. Charles Spurgeon uh, writes these words. He says, There are some who live on a sliding scale between condemnation and acceptance. I've met many over my time as a pastor, as a Christian, if health is buoyant and the heart is full of song, they're sure of their acceptance with God. But if the sun is darkened and the clouds return, when the heart is dull and sad, they imagine that they are under the ban of God's displeasure. They forget that our standing in Christ Jesus is one thing, our appreciation and enjoyment of it quite another. Your own heart may condemn you. Memory, the recorder of your soul, may summon from the past evidence against you. The great accuser of souls may lay against you grievous and well-founded charges. Your tides of feeling may ebb far down the beach. Your faith may become weak and lose its power and grip. Your sense of unworthiness may become increasingly oppressive. 
But none of these things can touch your acceptance with God if you are complying with his one all-inclusive con condition. No condemnation to them which are in Christ. A new self-portrait painted on a much better day. Our world, even our friends and our family, people around us, bombard us with lies about how we're this wretched picture. We're not this, this free before God picture. And I've used this phrase many times because I think it's such a, a good illustration and most everybody is familiar with the story of the Lion King. You know, Simba believed lies. Scar lied to him about his position, about what he'd done, and about the impact of what he'd done, and whether or not he would be accepted by his family. And so he ran away. He ran away and, and lived apart from who he was meant to be. And so Rafiki find, uh, searches him out and tries to remind him. And then he has this, this remembrance, this vision of his father. And his father says to him, remember who you are. And so I want to say to all of us, all of you, myself today, remember who you are. You are not condemned. You have been freed from sin by the Son of God himself. And God accepts you just as he does his own son. And he has given you the presence and power of himself to live the life of abundance and victory that he says you can have. He says, you're my child. You're not just a child of any father. You are, like Simba, a child of a king. Saved by amazing grace, empowered to live a victorious life by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Stand in Christ, in victorious living as his child. A couple weeks ago, we listened to Zach Williams' song, Chainbreaker, and in that song it said, if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, testify. Speak about it. Did you know that's what people around you need to hear? Is the hope that there is a life that is worth living? Be all that Christ has provided for you to be. I've chosen a song for us today to listen to by Matthew West. I um, was privileged to go to one of his concerts and, and meet him a few years ago. His father was a pastor. Um, his father travels with him, and they have a great ministry other than doing concerts. He actually provides opportunity for people to come down for prayer. Um, people find Christ in his concerts. They find Christ by living, listening to his songs. And this song is called, Hello, My Name Is... And it talks about all the wrong things that we have identified ourselves as being. But that the truth is that now, hello, my name is child of the one true king. A couple weeks ago, I told you that I came across a, a quote that said that much of our pastoral ministry is reminding our people of who they are in Christ again and again. And today I'm reminding you, if you have Christ in your heart, his spirit lives in you, and you are a child of the one true king. You've been saved. You've been redeemed. You are victorious. And all those lies that anybody tries to speak to you are not true of you anymore. You're a new portrait in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you that amazing grace is our song that we've been saved, we've been changed, we've been set free, that you have lavished your love upon us so that we can be called your children, that we're not defined by our mistakes of the past or by the weakest parts of our life, but defined by you and your presence in us. And when we leave this place and our past tries to make us think, well, it's not really true what the pastor said, Remind us that it's not what I said, it's what you've said. We are free. And if the sun sets us free, we are free indeed. Let us live, Father, as your children, victorious, 
over sin, victorious over fear, victorious over depression, anger, all of those things because we have life and we have peace with you and from you. May we go from this place today joyful in our hearts because that is our new song and tell the world, hello, my name is child of the one true king. Thank you for that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. Amen. 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 As you leave today, you may um, pull your, put your offering in the plate on the way out and exit through this door. Um, I believe that uh, Michelle and Brian will come up, one of them, to dismiss you. So thanks for being here, and have a victorious day in Jesus.